Remaining standing, let us pray. O Lord, uphold thou me that I may uplift thee. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Today's Gospel reading is a love story. In fact, it's really two love stories that mirror one another. One love story takes place on the smallest of human scales. Two insignificant people in a tiny corner of the Roman Empire. It's the love story between a mother and a daughter. The other love story takes place on the stage of cosmic history. It's the story of the love between God and his people, a story of ultimate significance for the entire human race. Can we doubt that the Canaanite woman loved her daughter very much? Imagine the love of this mother. I don't take, it doesn't take me much to imagine that with our granddaughter Haley. I think Jane is more of a mother than my mother ever was to me. And of course her mother is loving of her. Flesh of her flesh. They were yoked together in the bond of childbirth. Their love was nourished by the daily miracle of a mother growing child in the constant care of a mother. Imagine the anguish of this mother as the, as the daughter she loved lay severely ill. What kind of torture was that for her? It seemed to the woman that her daughter was possessed by a demon. What kind of world is this that is governed by forces like that? The world must have seemed like a hostile and unforgiving place to this mother. This woman's predicament was not like, unlike many people today. This is not a timeless, is this not a timeless and universal tale of poignancy? After all, despair comes in many forms. This morning we were worried about Mother Amy. How can that happen? It was an accident on the road. How could it happen to Mother Amy as she was doing the Lord's work? The demons of COVID and cancer and drugs stalk the darkness, destroying the lives of promise. The cult of youth abandoned its age to nursing homes Drought and flood takes its toil among our farmers and our neighbors. We live in a world that seems hostile to to too many of us. Too often, the world seems governed by forces that are beyond our control. We're desperate for solutions. Does anyone know where the love of God goes during these times? Is there enough of God's love to go around, or must it be reserved for the precious few. Are we in truth rejected by God and left to fend for ourselves in a hostile world? Yet this woman saw a ray of hope in her despair. It is attempting, it's tempting to assume that she was an exceptional person, uh, that she was perhaps a secret believer in Jesus, a sort of pre-resurrection Orthodox Christian of the Canaanite extraction. But the gospel doesn't tell us that. And in fact, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that she had come to the end of her rope. She wasn't particularly interested in the love of God. What concerned her was the love of her daughter. The only thing she wanted was to drive out this demon. She thought Jesus In the second love story, we're in a brief interlude as Jesus seeks shelter from the hostility that he was finding in Israel. The gospel story causes us to draw in our breath. In contrast to the clear love of the Canaanite woman for her daughter, Jesus' startling behavior casts doubt that he could possibly represent the God of love. Jesus seems to treat this woman cruelly And it's hard to reconcile his behavior with our knowledge of the God of love. Yet Jesus' reluctance to heal the little girl 
shows that he was as single-minded in his love of the children of Israel as the woman was in her love of her daughter. God had given Jesus a mission, and it wasn't to start a healing ministry. He did heal people, but the healing was intended to reveal God's rule in this world. The children of Israel were God's chosen instrument of that revelation. Our reading from Isaiah shows that all are welcome, but Israel was the bearer of the revelation. Jesus' healings were important in this revelation because they pointed to the presence of the kingdom of God in his ministry. But in themselves, the healings weren't that important. He left many in Israel unhealed. But few were, a few were healed that God's ways could be known on earth. But healing this woman's daughter help or hurt that revelation. Jesus took human divisions very seriously. If he started to heal the Canaanite and word got out, people might believe that he was, that Canaanite gods were behind his work. And that would be a big setback. Jesus' reputation was troubled enough, wasn't it? He had already been accused of being in league with the devil. Did he want to take a detour on the most important journey in the world history and risk it? whole journey. At first, Jesus didn't want to make the detour. He says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And I suspect that the woman was not surprised. After all, she did call him the son of David. And this was not business as usual. She may not have been surprised, but she sure was prepared. She came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. But Jesus was just as prepared to stay with his mission. It's not fair. Take the children's food and throw it to the dog. Our modern sensibilities are outraged at this comparison. But the woman seems to understand Jesus' concern to feed his own children first. After all, she would have done the same thing. She knew something about feeding children as well. Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. She wasn't asking Jesus to take any of God's love from the children of Israel. Wasn't there more than enough to spread around? The Canaanite woman and her child were indeed an intrusion on Jesus' ministry. I love to mention that Henry Nouwen wrote in one of his books that he was busy doing his ministry, all the work in the office and all of the things he scheduled and all like that. And if somebody knocked on the door and interrupted that, it really annoyed him until he figured out that the interruptions were his ministry. So this interruption was Jesus' ministry. Her complete willingness to be open to the startling ways of God seemed a welcome contrast to that he had recently found in Israel. Woman, great is your faith. The woman came to Jesus in complete trust, and only Jesus could be worthy of that kind of trust. I want you to notice two words in that. Woman. That was the word he used to address his mother in the miracle of changing water to wine. And your faith is great. That was the highest praise he ever gave to any of his ministry. This Canaanite woman, this stranger, this learner, got the highest praise from Jesus, higher than Peter, higher than John and James, higher than even his mother, higher than anybody. This one. Our God will not turn away anyone who turns to him. 
makes room for even the least of us in the midst of his most important plan. That is the difference between the personal God revealed to us in the Bible and all of the other gods that human beings worship. Paul says that God does not change his mind about whom he blesses, but God is willing to change his plan to include as many as will receive him. Our God is not an impersonal force, but a personal and caring God. We can come to him in trust because his const he constantly proves that he's worthy of our trust. We may have a hard time trusting him. Many of us, like the Canaanite woman, have to reach the end of our rope before we're ready to reach beyond business as usual. But God is patient with us and waits until we cannot wait any longer. All the while, God is not idle. God is physically at work in the world, searching out avenues of opportunity, silently, quietly bringing redemption out of despair. God's love doesn't depend on our cleverness. It doesn't depend on our orthodoxy. It only depends on God's faithfulness to God's promises. When we are at the end of our rope, when we feel powerless to act, we find we can still turn to God. As with many of our encounters with God, we come looking for one thing and find another. Indeed, the God of love never deserts us even when we desert God. Discovering this kind of love changes the way we see the world. There were many hostile forces in the world, but our story is not a horror story. The hostile forces have their way only until we turn to God. Every moment we are free to accept the love of a God who is ready to change his mind. No matter what we've done, no matter how close we are to the end of our route, in Christ our God stands ready to include us as a chapter in his love story.